additional note from the eventful history of the mutiny and piratical seizure of h m s bounty its cause and consequences this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Danny Sayers. The Eventful History of the Mutiny and Piratical Seizure of H.M.S. Bounty by Sir John Barrow. Additional Note. In reference to the subject of extraordinary passages made in open boats on the wide ocean, and the note thereon at page 127, the following may be added as another instance, the most painfully interesting, and the most calamitous, perhaps, ever recorded. It was related to Mr. Bennett, a gentleman deputed by the Missionary Society of London, together with the Reverend Daniel Tyerman, to visit their several stations in the South Sea Islands, by Captain George Pollard, the unfortunate sufferer whom these gentlemen met with at Rayatea, then a passenger in an American vessel, having a second time lost his ship near the Sandwich Islands. The narrative is extracted from the Journal of Voyages and Travels, just published, of the two gentlemen above mentioned, and is as follows. Quote, my first shipwreck was in open sea on the 20th of November, 1820, near the equator, about 118 degrees west longitude. The vessel, a South Sea whaler, was called the Essex. On that day, as we were on the lookout for sperm whales, and had actually struck two, when the boat's crews were following to secure, I perceived a very large one, it might be eighty or ninety feet long, rushing with great swiftness through the water right towards the ship. We hoped that she would turn aside and dive under when she perceived such a bulk in her way, but no, the animal came full force against our stern post. Had any quarter less firm been struck, the vessel must have been burst, as it was, every plank and timber trembled throughout her whole bulk the whale as though hurt by a severe and unexpected concussion shook its enormous head and sheared off to so considerable a distance that for some time we had lost sight of her from the starboard quarter of which we were very glad hoping that the worst was over Nearly an hour afterwards we saw the same fish. We had no doubt of this from her size and the direction in which she came, making again towards us. We were at once aware of our danger, but escape was impossible. She dashed her head this time against the ship's side, and so broke it in that the vessel filled rapidly, and soon became water-logged. At the second shock, expecting her to go down, we lowered our three boats with the utmost expedition, and all hands, twenty in the hole, got into them, seven, and seven, and six. In a little while, as she did not sink, we ventured on board again, and by scuttling the deck were enabled to get out some biscuit, beef, water, rum, two sextants, a quadrant, and three compasses. These, together with some rigging, a few muskets, powder, etc., we brought away, and, dividing the stores among our three small crews, rigged the boats as well as we could, there being a compass for each, and a sextant for two, and a quadrant for one, but neither sextant nor quadrant for the third. End note. 42. Then, instead of pushing away for some port, so amazed and bewildered were we, that we continued sitting in our places, gazing upon the ship, as though she had been an object of the tenderest affection. 
our eyes could not leave her, till, at the end of many hours, she gave a slight reel, then down she sank. No words can tell our feelings. We looked at each other, we looked at the place where she had so lately been afloat, and we did not cease to look, till the terrible conviction of our abandoned and perilous situation roused us to exertion, if deliverance were yet possible. We now consulted about the course which it might be best to take, westward to India, eastward to South America, or south-westward to the Society Isles. We knew that we were at no great distance from Tahiti, but were so ignorant of the state and temper of the inhabitants, that we feared we should be devoured by cannibals if we cast ourselves on their mercy. It was determined, therefore, to make for South America, which we computed to be more than two thousand miles distant. Accordingly, we steered eastward, and, though for several days harassed with squalls, we contrived to keep together. It was not long before we found that one of the boats had started a plank, which was no wonder, for whale-boats are all clinker-built, and very slight, being made of half-inch plank only, before planing. To remedy this alarming defect, we all turned to, and having emptied the damaged boat into the two others, we raised her side as well as we could, and succeeded in restoring the plank at the bottom. Through this accident, some of our biscuit had become injured by the salt water. This was equally divided among the several boats' crews. Food and water, meanwhile, with our utmost economy, rapidly failed. Our strength was exhausted, not by abstinence only, but by the labors which we were obliged to employ to keep our little vessels afloat amidst the storms which repeatedly assailed us. One night we were parted in rough weather, but though the next day we fell in with one of our companion boats, we never saw or heard any more of the other which probably perished at sea, being without either sextant or quadrant. When we were reduced to the last pinch, and out of everything, having been more than three weeks abroad, we were cheered with the sight of a low, uninhabited island, which we reached in hope, but were bitterly disappointed. There were some barren bushes and many rocks, on this forlorn spot, the only provision that we could procure were a few birds and their eggs. This supply was soon reduced, the sea-fowls appeared to have been frightened away, and their nests were left empty after we had once or twice plundered them. What distressed us most was the utter want of fresh water. We could not find a drop anywhere, till at the extreme verge of ebb tide, a small spring was discovered in the sand, but even that was too scanty to afford us sufficient to quench our thirst before it was covered by the waves at their return. There being no prospect but that of starvation here, we determined to put to sea again. Three of our comrades, however, chose to remain and we pledged ourselves to send a vessel to bring them off, if we ourselves should ever escape to a Christian port. With a very small morsel of biscuit for each, and a little water, we again ventured out on the wide ocean. In the course of a few days our provisions were consumed. Two men died. We had no other alternative than to live upon their remains. These we roasted to dryness by means of fires kindled on the ballast sand at the bottom of the boats. End note 44. When this supply was spent, what could we do? We looked at each other with horrid thoughts in our minds, but we held our tongues. I am sure that we loved one another as brothers all the time, and yet 
our looks told plainly what must be done. We cast lots, and the fatal one fell on my poor cabin boy. I started forward instantly, and cried out, My lad, my lad, if you don't like your lot, I'll shoot the first man that touches you. The poor emaciated boy hesitated a moment or two, then, quietly laying his head down upon the gunwale of the boat, he said, I like it as well as any other. He was soon dispatched, and nothing of him left. I think then another man died of himself, and him too we ate. But I can tell you no more. My head is on fire at the recollection. I hardly know what to say. I forgot to say that we had parted company with the second boat before now, after some more days of horror and despair, when some were lying down at the bottom of the boat, not able to rise, and scarcely one of us could move a limb, a vessel hove in sight. We were taken on board, and treated with extreme kindness. The second, last boat, was also picked up at sea, and the survivors saved. A ship afterwards sailed in search of our companions on the desolate island, and brought them away. Close quote. Captain Pollard closed his dreary narrative with saying, in a tone of despondency never to be forgotten by him who heard it, quote, After a time I found my way to the United States, to which I belonged, and got another ship, that too, I have lost by a second wreck off the Sandwich Islands, and now I am utterly ruined. No owner will ever trust me with a whaler again, for all will say I am an unlucky man. Close quote. The following account respecting the three men that were left on the uninhabited island is given in a note of the same work, and said to be extracted from a religious tract, number 579, issued by the Society in Paternoster Row. Quote, On the 26th of December, the boats left the island. This was indeed a trying moment to all. They separated with mutual prayers and good wishes. Seventeen, in note, forty-four, venturing to sea with almost certain death before them, while three remained on a rocky isle, destitute of water, and affording hardly anything to support life. The prospects of these three poor men were gloomy. They again tried to dig a well, but without success, and all hope seemed at an end, when, providentially, they were relieved by a shower of rain. They were thus delivered from the immediate apprehension of perishing by thirst. Their next care was to procure food, and their difficulties herein were also very great. Their principal resource was small birds, about the size of a blackbird, which they caught while at roost. Every night they climbed the trees in search of them, and obtained by severe exertions a scanty supply hardly enough to support life. Some of the trees bore a small berry, which gave them a little relief, but these were found only in small quantities. Shellfish they searched for in vain, and although from the rocks they saw at times a number of sharks, and also other sorts of fish, they were unable to catch any, as they had no fishing tackle. Once they saw several turtles, and succeeded in taking five, but they were then without water. At those times they had little inclination to eat, and before one of them was quite finished, the others were become unfit for food. Their sufferings from want of water were the most severe, their only supply being from what remained in holes among the rocks after the showers which fell at intervals and sometimes they were five or six days without any. On these occasions they were compelled to suck the blood of the birds they caught, which allayed their thirst and 
some degree. But they did so very unwillingly, as they found themselves much disordered thereby. Among the rocks were several caves formed by nature, which afforded shelter from the wind and rain. In one of these caves they found eight human skeletons. In all probability the remains of some poor mariners who had been shipwrecked on the isle, and perished for want of food and water. They were side by side, as if they had laid down and died together. This sight deeply affected the mate and his companions. Their case was similar, and they had every reason to expect ere long the same end, for many times they lay down at night, with their tongues swollen, and their lips parched with thirst, scarcely hoping to see the morning sun. And it is impossible to form an idea of their feelings when the morning dawned, and they found their prayers had been heard, and answered by a providential supply of rain. In this state they continued till the 5th of April following. On the morning of that day they were in the woods as usual, searching for food and water, as well as their weakness permitted, when their attention was aroused by a sound which they thought was distant thunder, but looking towards the sea they saw a ship in the offing, which had just fired a gun. Their joy at this sight may be more easily imagined than described. They immediately fell on their knees, and thanked God for his goodness, in thus sending deliverance when least expected. Then, hastening to the shore, they saw a boat coming towards them. As the boat could not approach the shore without great danger, the mate, being a good swimmer, and stronger than his companions, plunged into the sea, and providentially escaped a watery grave at the moment when deliverance was at hand. His companions crawled out further on the rocks, and, by the great exertions of the crew, were taken into the boat, and soon found themselves on board the Surrey, commanded by Captain Rain, by whom they were treated in the kindest manner, and their health and strength were speedily restored. Close quote. Mr. Montgomery, the editor, observes, quote, There is some incongruity in these two narratives, which more minute particulars might reconcile. Close quote. We have noticed them. Mr. Bennet received the account verbally, and may be mistaken in some points, but there is little doubt of its being substantially correct. This melancholy history supplies an additional and complete answer to Bly's doubts of men feeding on each other to preserve existence. End of an additional note Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California, for LibriVox.